Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, May 26th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we will explore the piece that Eno had published at The Athletic on Thursday morning. There are no longer hitters counts. We'll dig into why and we'll dig into a way you might be able to take advantage of that with your fantasy teams in the immediate and long-term future. We're going to talk about some struggling hitters who could be drops in shadow leagues, possibly by lows in some cases, try and diagnose a few more issues with guys that are struggling as we move through the end of the second month of the season. Among those players, not someone you would drop, but someone that we're always curious about, Wander Franco. Kind of wondering where his power has been through the first two months of the season. Um, so lots of ground to cover today and before the show. I learned that, you know, like many people, does not peel bananas correctly. So I I feel I feel an obligation to the listeners of this podcast to bestow the occasional blew my mind, the occasional nugget of life wisdom. I I have very few things in my life that I can pass (laughs) on. I, I consider to be valuable knowledge to other people. Like what what I do is mostly in the useless information department. But I imagine that most people listen to this podcast are like Eno prior to today, where they take a banana and they peel from the top where the stem is, where the bananas connect to each other. And oftentimes, as you're kind of breaking that stem, you're bruising the top of the banana, which is unpleasant. The banana's still edible. It's fine. It's just kind of weird to like, you bruise the banana the and then part eat it. Off or... And you're wasting the banana and you don't want to do that. My advice, my tip is to take the banana, flip it upside down and peel it from the bottom. You will bruise the banana considerably less. And even though there's not a little handle, a little pull tab to grab onto, it will peel very easily. So it's a that de- is de- deceptive pull tab. You're right. <laughs> yeah, there's no like visual cue there, but I, I assure you it will peel very easily. So I'm just happy to offer something for the greater good because I so rarely have something like that that people are unaware of <laughs> i will uh I, I have a banana upstairs it's slightly overdue uh, mm. it but... might peel itself at a certain point right. <laughs> but I, I might uh might have it with lunch and test your theory that's a smoothie banana in our house that's that's what that becomes yeah overripe bananas into smoothies or um, banana bread but the problem with banana bread is you need to have like five overripe bananas yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you have five overripe bananas, you bought too many bananas. I, I think you basically went on vacation and forgot that you bought bananas <laughs> yeah. and just threw them in the car <laughs> as a snack. But uh, <laughs> the uh, the other bit of banana talk, I was going through the Rolling Stone top 500 albums of all time when I was back home in Wisconsin. And my dad likes to have a few cocktails and, and turn on music. And he, he likes mostly classic rock. Um, so, you know, Zeppelin to Aerosmith like that era is kind of mm-hmm. his his sweet spot right so we're going through the list and talking about the best albums of all time and of course after a few cocktails he's he's kind did, of pushing back on the list which I had nothing to do with I was way, real quick messenger did you know that Aerosmith probably stole uh Stairway from Spirit I did not know that yeah this is a there's a band called what is it is it the, yeah I think the band is called Spirit you should check it out just google it so like, let, really let Zeppelin close. stole Stairway. Yeah, it's really, really close. Wow. Hmm. Uh, anyway, the banana thing that that uh, was on my mind from from that whole thing was the Velvet Underground and Nico. That album was actually, oh. I think, a top 25 album. And it was one of the albums high on the list that I'd really never heard anything from. And I started listening to it and was really digging it. So just throwing that out there, too. Again, trying to add some pleasantries to life at a time where we are... Uh, maybe searching a little harder than usual to find some things to feel good about. Uh, but we're going to talk about your story because your story was really good. And it's really interesting because the way teams uh, attack hitters is just different than it used to be. And it kind of drives at this idea that there are no longer hitters counts. So first off, what led you to dig into this? Was you, were you watching a game? Are you talking to players? And, and like what what even inspired this? I think it's just, uh, you know, I wrote a piece for Fangraphs a few years ago. Is it like time for you know, the league to go to 70% sliders? And ever since then, I've just been tracking breaking ball usage across the league. And it keeps going up. And the weird part for me is that it keeps going up, but whiff rates on breaking balls keep going up too. 
And I think that part of that is pitch design. We're just like, you know, we're leaning really far into sweepers. I talked to Griffin Jacks about his, he has a power sweeper. He's one of the hardest sweepers in the league. And then there's, um, there's, a, there's a new pitch probably coming up through the ranks in, uh, I heard maybe the Yankees and Dodgers are investing heavily in a 93 mile an hour gyro slider. And when I say gyro slider, that's a slider that doesn't move when it, if you looked in like Statcast or Brooks Baseball, it would look like kind of a zero zero, um, meaning it's a lot of bullet spin and um, yeah, it's not straight because straight means it's not dropping. Yeah. It's like what a pitch would do with gravity. Mm. So the reason it works though is because every other pitch moves, right? It's like the one pitch that doesn't move and everything else moves, and then it goes ninety five. So um, the research on stuff and, you know, suggests that any pitch, any breaking pitch over 85, almost any pitch over 85, it, it's a breaking pitch uh, is good. And so I think some teams are like, oh, if that's true, let's develop a bunch of like Emmanuel classes, you know, <laughs> let's like have a bunch of guys who throw 93, 95 on our cutters, you know. Uh, so that's happening. And right now at the major league level, the sweepers happening. So I think we're getting better at pitch design. So that's, um, you know, saying slider is not monolith anymore. There's all these like crazy designed up sliders that are, that, um, that are helping the whiff rates stay high. But I think the main thing is, I think maybe more hitters should sit slider because we're getting very close to the amount of um forcing fastballs equaling the amount of sliders sliders are like 24 25 getting close there uh four seamers are all the way down to like sort of 32 33 if those numbers were equal i think you could do just as good a job sitting slider as sitting fastball but the sort of general philosophy in hitting still is hit the fastball well, there still seems to be a, a difference, a pretty significant difference between fastball usage among starters and relievers, right? I mean, the most extreme example, the the league should throw 70% sliders. Like Matt Whistler read that story and then became that guy. And now he's throwing even more sliders. He's got a 93.8% slider usage rate right now for the Rays. He's thrown 6.3% four seamers. It's only a 90 mile an hour fastball. So yeah, he probably shouldn't throw it. Right. I, I mean, like, <laughs> That's the extreme short relief example. Yeah, I Whistler think. was a, was came up a lot. And I talked to Griffin Jacks, who was with the Twins. Whistler was converted into a seventy percent slider guy with the Twins, and they also uh, picked up Sergio Romo. So they they're they're leaning into this whole idea. Yeah, and Matt Whistler once upon a time was a starter. It's really hard to <laughs> hard to believe. Now. The only the only slider that the only starter that's anything like that is Jake Junis who right now I think is still throwing 60% sliders and he's quote unquote starter. You know, he's kind of that four to five inning 80 pitch kind of starter. Right. The follower that doesn't follow the follow that starts. Uh, yeah. But, uh, well, you know, wait, wait, this wait, is, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Jake Tunis has gone at least five innings in every outing so far this season. He's made six appearances. He's yeah, gone I think he's been really efficient. How many pitches? It's like 80 pitches still. Yeah, it's still a low pitch count. And I'm looking at the the batters faced 16, 19, 21, 24, 24, 22. All a little right. higher than I would have thought. Yeah. Okay. I thought he was more like in that 16, 17. But um, no, so, but it's working for him. And I talked to him about it. And he was just like, hey, it's my best pitch. Like, why would I pit throw my other ones? And if you look at stuff plus, it's amazing. Like his slider is a 140 stuff plus, And then all of his other pitches are like 80 minus. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. But if you have one pitch that's that good and you can throw it that often and it's still effective, then keep doing it. I think that's the question. Anytime you have a pitch that gets swings and misses, a really effective pitch, use it more, see what happens. Use it more, see what happens. Eventually, <laughs> you probably have some diminishing returns. If everything else is used so infrequently or is so ineffective, then eventually that amazing pitch isn't going to get as many whiffs as it did, right? It's not going to be as good as it was because that's what hitters are looking for. So you do have to find that balance. But I think what this suggests to me is that we weren't there yet. We weren't even close to what usage equilibrium we should be at 
for a lot of pitchers because there was maybe still some some older school thinking or even maybe new school thinking ball. too where it was, yeah, it was established the fastball established the fastball and hit the fastball you see how these things go hand in hand right but then there was also the have this other pitch to throw like if you're a righty have a pitch for lefties that you only throw to lefties well maybe that pitch wasn't very good either because you're only throwing it 10 percent of the time you're not really working on it that much mm. right and then people know when you're going to throw things too and I struggled it, about this with Brady Singer because the fastball and slider are good, but you know he's had a couple. You know he's had a couple good starts, and it was like, oh, the changeup, the changeup. The, well, the changeup doesn't look good. He doesn't locate it well, and it doesn't have good stuff. Hmm. How much does it matter that he has it? Right. Well, maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Well, then it goes back to a conversation we've had probably a few times on the show where it's like multiple pitches are good generally good but if the third and fourth pitch are truly bad pitches maybe it's not as helpful as if they're just average pitches right there's there's got to be some it's variation likely to be there. balls i think you know yeah that's can't i think it's... for a strike can't get guys to chase it yeah what good like, is it why does rodon not throw his change up he can't control it it's a good pitch he just can't control it so if it's going to be a ball people see see change if they spit on it so i mean i, I think you know slider command is a, a big part of this and you know, if you look at the slider command list, um, as I did on Twitter the other day, um, you'll see that there's a lot of kind of like uh, maybe surprising uh, pitchers. I know uh, Kyle Gibson is on it. Um, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, here it is. Tyler Wells is number one. <laughs> Of course, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pitching Plus. <laughs> the, 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 the rates and barrels, uh, he's, our, he's our mascot. Uh, mm -hmm. Jameson Tyon, second. Justin Verlander, Keegan Aiken, uh, fourth. Anthony Bass, Kyle Gibson, Logan Gilbert, Drew Rasmussen, Garrett Cole, and Will Crow. Uh, who, by the way, um, really interesting pickup for holds out of your starting pitching slot. That's like relevant to four people listening. Very specific. <laughs> Glad we could help four of you. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but then the, the flip side, though, I think is hitters that are good at hitting the slider are in more demand this year and uh, generally have a lower strikeout rate and are really good. So let's let's look at just uh, this is pitch type values. Which what would you rather I do? I, I can do pitch type values. I'll do both. But pitch type values first. This is uh, the, the best hitters against sliders this year by pitch type value. So that's summing up all, everything that happens on those whiffs, takes for, for balls and homers, whatever. Number one, Paul Goldschmidt. Number two is Austin Riley, who once told me that he felt in between fastballs and sliders. So uh, very interesting. His work against fastballs is not amazing. It's about league average. So I think maybe he just leaned in and said, hey, I'm going to demolish sliders and do, you know, fight off fastballs, basically. But Goldschmidt, Judge, Stanton, Harper, they're on this list because they do both. Uh, but Jazz Chisholm, uh, way better against sliders. He's fifth against sliders in the league uh, than he is against fastballs. Austin Hayes took a big step this year. He's sixth against sliders. Uh, Michael Brantley is eighth against sliders and has a negative value against fastballs. And I do think that you have to kind of look at these in tandem because Nico Horner is 12th against sliders and has a negative work against fastballs. Austin Meadows is 14th against sliders and has a negative value against fastballs. I think if you're doing that, that, that might be evidence of, of sitting slider and it not working for you to some extent. Right. And so that's why I wanted to uh, look at Wander Franco real quick, because, you know, what we when we see Wander Franco, we see like an OK, like still good raw power. Uh, you know, maybe where's the launch angle? Where are the barrels? Is he going to be a good but not great player? Um, and so I wanted to throw up some visuals here for you on YouTube and I'll describe it for the podcast. This is Wander Franco as a lefty against sliders. You see how he pulls Almost everything. There's nothing, nothing to left field. It's center and right. Uh, and it looks like a decent approach, except you might notice not that many homers. You know, uh, now let's look at his fastball heat map as a left hander. Well, that's a lot of pushing for fastballs. Yes, he's pulled some balls on the ground there and he has two homers. But look how much there is in left field. 
So I think he's got an approach where he's like trying to be early on, the, you know, trying to get the slider out front, you know, and hit that for home runs and then fight off the fastball a little bit, let the fastball travel a little bit. And it's an okay, it's a good approach for contact, which he's amazing at, right? It's a good approach for batting average. Um, it's not an amazing approach for power, as you can tell. Two two pulled fastballs there for homers is what I'm I'm guessing. I mean, you, when you're looking at heat maps, you're kind of guessing, but the blue looks like it's. I would say that's two. Um, and uh, and so that's uh, that's the kind of push and pull where like you know using this for analysis is, is tough. But I think that generally hitters that can uh, that can do something with sliders are are. It's a little bit like command with pitchers. It's like, oh, I like them a little bit better. You know, there's only going to be more. Every year we get more sliders. If you're good at sliders, you're at least doing something that every year there's going to be more of. You know? Yeah, I guess the the natural question I have is when you, you're you looking at two months worth of games or a little less than that, and you see someone who is thriving or at the other end, maybe struggling in a big way against sliders or any one pitch, do you still have the... This is a very small sample sort of thing, or, or is it is it quick to be this is, something that is stable? Here's a there is a name for you that's perfect for what you just asked. Eric Hosmer. Eric Hosmer right now is 15th in the league against sliders. He has uh, over his career not been great against sliders, and I think that his early, uh, you know, and and hitters will very rarely admit something like this. It's too like their approach. Like they, it's too like oh. He just said in this article he's sitting sliders. Okay, well, let's fill him up with fastballs. You know what I mean? Like it's too, it's too much. But if I had to guess, I would say Eric Hosmer was sitting slider a little bit more early this season. Uh, especially you can tell he was swinging at uh, inner half, uh, inner half pitches. I bet you right handers trying to back foot him on the slider. He just started looking for that. He's like, anything that's off of my back foot on the inside is, you know, in the zone, I'm gonna turn and burn. And I think it it did well for him, but over the course of the season, we're seeing him slow down. Maybe they back, they bury that, that slider more, or they start uh, throwing back door sliders on the outside, you know, and trying to get him to swing or, or, or take those for called strikes. So, you know, I did do one, it was a multiple year one. And now if you do a multiple year one, it really just is the best hitters in baseball. Number one, Jordan Alvarez. Number two, Bryce Harper. Number three, J.D. Martinez. Number four, John Carlos Stanton. Number five, Taylor Ward, small sample in the group. Number six, Manny Machado. Number seven, Freddie Freeman. Number eight, Austin Riley. Number nine, Ronald Acuna. Number 10, Jazz Chisholm. If I was going to give you any surprises off this list, uh, Josh Bell at 11, uh, Jesus Aguilar at 15, Goldie still there at 16, not a surprise. Austin Meadows. But he's also the first, the only one in the top 20 that has a negative fastball value. So it is fair to wonder if Austin Meadows needs a new approach. But Wander's there in the top 20. Austin Hayes is there in the top 25. Um, you know, th I think these are good things for those players. I think I like Austin Hayes more now that I've read this. This actually worked out exceptionally well. Sometimes things just flow perfectly but we're talking about struggling bats on this episode too and i just noticed lourdes guriel jr has been good against sliders i'm looking at a multi-year leaderboard going back mm. to 2019 he's been very good against sliders but has a negative run value against fastballs he's among the struggling bats that you'd be looking at right now in a eight or ten team league especially and, and saying what do i do here or if you're in a, a slightly deeper league do you, do you trade for him do you reserve him how, how do you handle Guriel, like how much of a flaw do you think it is in a, a multi-year view to see, yeah, you thrive in this one area, but you're actually below average. I mean, among good hitters especially, be, like being negative really stands out against fastballs because the truly great hitters are going to be excellent against fastballs. So if you're yeah. not even just decent against them, you're very different than those players, even though you might be as good against sliders as those elite players are. Yeah, I think it's the Meadows problem, too. And, you know, the two of them, I think, are fascinating because, you know, they're not of an age where collapse is what you'd expect. Uh, their strikeout rates are are good and have been better the last couple of years. Uh, but their power is gone. And you look at that, you look at that fastball value and you just say there's there. 
they're maybe they're sitting slider and maybe it's good for their 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 strikeout rate, but it's not hasn't been good for their power. And um, you know, I'm kind of I as much as I've said that I like guys that uh, hit the fastball well. In this, in these two cases, I mean, in the slider. Well, in these two cases, I think it's it's gone too far. And you you look at the barrel rates they've got, um, and you look at their 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 what looks like slider centric approach, and you say, in this case, it's not working out. And I don't know if I'm in on either of them. You know, I don't know if I want to buy low on either of them. The I think the baseline projection for both of them has a good batting average in it. But I, I wouldn't believe the power much. You know, there's some projections for Lourdes Goriel that have 15 homers. I believe the one that has 12 homers is another thing I'm saying, you know. So now you're talking about a 260 hitter with 12 homers. On Meadows, uh, there's some projections that have him with 18 more homers. And that's totally fair because he's had a 33 and he had a 27 last year. With that barrel rate he has right now, with the slider approach he has right now, I'm going to believe the projections that say he has 12 more homers in it. So both of these guys are guys that like, listen, if you can get them for almost free because they'll, they'll probably hit 250, 260 uh, with 12 homers and a couple stolen bases. If that's, you know, in a deep league, you know, if somebody's like, you know, going to hand them to you, then, then do it because th- I think they'll both play. I don't know about the injury with Meadows right now, but you know, it's, a, I think it's a decent time to pick them up in deep leagues because that'll play in deep leagues, but anything, even in a 15 team league, 260, 12, and three is that's uh, I don't even like that's th- I, I, that's like a streamer bat, right? Like, it's if you rough, were talking about yeah. like 15 team NFBC, like that's not something you want in your lineup every day. That's like, oh, he's in Colorado or something, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, yeah, I think it's it's kind of interesting too. We've talked a lot about Joey Votto on the last few episodes, he was our player spotlight on the 3 0 show that went up on Thursday. And, you know, it's something that comes back a lot when we're talking about projections that guys after age 33, I think, is where the the cutoff Mm -hmm. tends to be, is where the projections start to get wobbly. And with Votto, on the last few episodes, the recurring theme has been, but he's Joey Votto. It's very, it's very soft, right? We've seen him make adjustments. We know, we know what kind of hitter he is at the other end. And this guy's not on the wrong side of 33 yet. I was thinking of Javier Baez as an example of a player that, you know, describe a player with the opposite approach of Joey Votto. Well, Javier Baez or Jorge Alfaro, guys that strike out a lot, that don't walk, they would be the kind of players that I would say are kind of at the opposite end of of how they try to go up there and and do damage. All the things we would say about Votto and being comfortable with him, I would feel and say the opposite about Baez when things are going wrong. He's hitting 201, he's got three homers, 10 runs scored, 12 RBIs so far this season and no stolen bases yet. And part of it might be just adjusting to a new environment, switching to a new league. We talk about this all the time with players that sign big hey, contracts, just trying highest, to earn every dollar with every swing, chasing more pitches. chase rate of his career right now. Not a surprise to see that. That's, that's normal for players that are in a situation like this. But I think it is more difficult for me to talk myself into the correction happening just because of, of the way bias has been good in the past. Like the way he's got there has always seemed problematic in the long run. So is this going too far though? Is this, is this saying, is it taking the soft sciences and, and kind of just making them say what we want or, or choosing to react however we want? Well, I just, I think generally in sort of dynasty long-term settings, this was, I think the worst uh, contract of the off season and uh, and the fact I've talked about this before that you know the the contact on outside uh, on, on pitches outside the zone ages terribly and um, and when it falls off the cliff it really falls off the cliff so if you're a, a guy who swings at half the pitches outside the zone um, and then you know I think I, I ran the numbers and like slugging percentage on pitches outside the zone it starts with a two uh and slugging percentage on pitches inside the zone starts with like a four or five you know it's like that come on man. checks like, out yes that's yeah, a, a like, much more hittable cluster of pitches sure yeah so uh this is not something i would bet on long term the only thing that, that that yeah and 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 lo and behold his uh you know zone con- his out of zone contact rate is the worst it's been since rookie season a fairly big drop off and he's reaching a lot outside the zone and this is the kind of stuff you would see 
um, from other people who've collapsed early, like Josh Hamilton, Pablo Sandoval, um, who had similar approaches. On the other hand, he is still 29, and he is the streakiest mofo I've ever seen. And if you look at his past uh, six seasons, the only one where he didn't get to an okay number at the end of the season, like a pretty decent one for fantasy, was the one where he didn't get a full season. Mm. You know, like right. 2020. So, like, I I don't have any shares. I don't think I would have the fortitude, uh, the intestinal fortitude to trade for Javi Baez right now because he doesn't line up with my belief system. <laughs> you know, like, just doesn't do the things I want my hitters to do. But I, I can't. I can't say that he, you know, like the projections are for 17 homers, 10 stolen bases, 250 average. Like that's, that's valuable. And if you can get him, I, I you know how I see him a hail Mary. Hmm. I think he's a hail Mary. You're in ninth place right now. It's not a keeper league. You don't worry about next year. Hi, right. Javi Baez is like, well, I'm screwed either way. And somebody's going to give me Javi Baez. He's had these troughs below, but actually this is one of those worst, but you know, Look at the other season. 2020, he just didn't have that a big peak to set it off. Look at 2018. Fairly big trough, you know, the beginning of the season. Hot second half. Look at 2021. Not, you know, fairly big trough early in the season. Look at him go off. Yeah, and if you want to see the visual, I pulled up his rolling WOBA for every 15 games over on Fangraphs. If you're listening and you're like, what what are they describing? See it on YouTube or you can just pull it up yourself. And I I think, again, we've talked about this maybe three or four weeks ago. It's a good way to visualize what might be within the range of normal for a player. Because Mm -hmm. anytime we go through a month or two months when a player is significantly over or underperforming, usually when it's underperforming, we start to think the sky is falling. It's broken. The player's not coming back. And you look at the chart and you go, oh, actually, no, this has happened before. We're not at an all-time low. We haven't reached a, a new bottom. It's, and, especially and that's probably the case here. For volatile players. And volatility has tried to strike out rating. He's a high strikeout guy. So he's just going to be a volatile player. And so the, big, the tops and the bottoms are just going to be further apart. You sent me a, a link before we started recording, too. It was, I believe, strike percentage on sliders. Is that what the search you ran uh, over at Savant? Is, yeah, swinging strike percentage on, on sliders uh, for hitters. And this, I think, is a little bit more useful in a one-year format than because it's not how many balls bounce in the right direction and, and stuff like that. It's also less useful in other ways because Adam Frazier is uh, third in baseball at swinging strike percentage on, on sliders. And... I mean, you could have guessed that he's probably third in most pitches, right? <laughs> like, right. Yeah, and not surprisingly, we're talking about 282 players on this list. Javier Baez third from the bottom, 35.2 percent so oh, among my, among the absolute worst. Joey Votto not far away, right? Two very different approaches and yet a similar <laughs> problem. It's kind of it's kind of funny like that. Yes, but the age difference is meaningful here. Yeah. No. I'm, I'm, yeah. Just, just pointing it out that Votto is at 273, 28. But if you if you want some hope for Mitch Garver, he's seventh in 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 slider contact rate. Uh, Jerickson Profar is tenth. Jesse Winker is still eleventh in slider contact rate. So uh, you know other guys that, you, that we've been talking about. Eric Hosmer is sixth. Manny Machado is fourteenth. Um, you know Goldschmidt is seventeenth. Taylor Ward. Taylor Ward uh, was really interesting. I talked to him, and he's got that that new uh, approach that's working so well right now. Uh, that's a response kind of to the way pitchers are pitching. So if you target the high fastball and you create a swing that can hit the high fastball, uh, the low slider. I've talked this with Adrian Beltre. The low slider looks like crap, uh, and so you, you're basically set because you can, it's easier for you to spin on the low slider and you can hit the high fastball. Taylor Ward also makes good contact with sliders. That's why he's so white hot right now. He can make good contact with the slider. And then if you give him a high fastball, he can spank it. So uh, it took him a while to get here. Maybe the league actually had to change to make his approach work better. If you think about it, you know, Um, but I also wonder how long it'll last. Mark Canna's like this. Marcus Simeon uh, was like this last year. Is, is it something that's exploitable after a while? People start throwing you high sliders. People start filling up the bottom of the zone. I'm wondering with Marcus Simeon, what you do in a shadow league right now. 
I mean, in a, again, eight or 10 team league, which people do play in. Like, I know we don't focus on them a lot during draft season. We are in a 10 team league. We are in a 10 team league. I think I have Simeon. And I think in a league like that, where you've got IL spots and I think it's five player benches, okay, you could hold them on the bench for a while. Like, you could bench the, them a little bit. The point of the bench is to hold the player that you don't want to drop play. and then to then mix and match <laughs> your pitchers as much as you possibly can. So, whether it's a player like Simeon, an early round pick who's struggling, or that early in the season, maybe a prospect you're waiting on, you can, you can burn a spot for something. This would be a good in season use of a bench spot. I guess I'm wondering if you've seen anything in the last couple of weeks that makes you think that Simeon is starting to work his way out of these early season struggles. One thing that's really notable is his lack of fly balls this year. And, um, you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, over the course of last season, he started hitting more and more fly balls and it was pretty good for his, for his overall product project, production. If you kind of look at the rolling graphs of fan graphs. And so then this season, he came in with that fly ball approach early in the season and cratered, you know. So I will say he has changed his approach because his fly ball rate is now down. So what I'm guessing is, you know, what fly balls are, are they're the result of two things, right? Your, your swing mechanics, but also the pitches you're swinging at. High pitches go for fly balls and low pitches go for uh, for ground balls. My guess is that they filled up the bottom of the zone against Marcus Simeon. You know, and so now he's like trying to show them that he can he can fend it off and he can do something with it. So my guess is that what will return first is the batting average, right? He's swinging at lower pitches. He's going to start driving those lower pitches at some point. And he's going to try and force the pitchers to go back up in the in, at the top of the zone. So if he starts uh, stringing together some hits, I think that is uh, what you what you start to look at. If you look at uh, you know the last seven games, uh, he's got ten hits. I think that's I think that's the beginning, you know. And so the batting average comes up, but what that means for his power is not good news. Uh, you know, there's zips has them for 20 bat has them for 17. I'll take the 17. It, it is weird too. Cause I know someone has pointed oh, this out right. in the email before. It's just that what Simeon did last year, a lot of people chalk it up to Dunedin and the way the Jays season was strange playing in that park and then going back to Toronto, but his splits, at least in terms of home runs, don't really back that up. And, to see this much of a collapse this quickly, I think it's really surprising because he didn't strike me as a guy that had a, a bad approach or an approach that could be quickly and easily exploited. I mean, so you're you're saying 17 home runs the rest of the way, and you're probably on the underside of that. No, I, I mean I'll take it. I, I think okay. I think he can get there. I think it'll be like you know the average creeps up, the average creeps up, and then some pitchers like man, you know he's he's killing me on these singles and doubles. You know, let me try and sneak some cheese by him up top, and then he can use his old approach. The big difference was that, as he told me at the All-Star game, um, was that sometime in 2019, uh, he discovered that if he targeted the top half of the ball, which is not what, what hitters normally do, if he, if he targeted the top half of the ball on, on four seamers, he could hit the, the high fastball. Mm -hmm. and he, he, he discovered against the world as Chapman of all people. And so what you see in 2019, 2020, and 2021 is the fly ball rate go up, the pull rate go up, the home run rate go up. Um, I just think it got to the point where he really liked he really liked that approach. It was really working well for him. And pitchers were like, okay, we just we can't throw him high fastballs anymore. Let's get to a few other players that have underperformed in a big way. Robbie Grossman is one that I think some people looked at as a possible cheap 2020 guy where he was going again. Still looking for his first homer through 36 games entering play on Thursday. A 30.6% K rate so far. An awful 189, 306, 227 line. Grossman does have a couple of steals so far. But this is another guy. You look at the profile. Even if you don't want to buy in as a 2020 guy, he said, yeah, 12 to 15 homers and a healthy number of steals and plenty of playing time with a good spot atop an improving lineup. I think it was easy to talk yourself into Grossman, at least as sort of a, 
a low average does everything else sort of well player back during draft season it has not been the case so far you know it's funny I, I i did draft him in a couple places hoping for about 240 15 15 and if you even the most pessimistic of the projections right now um would have him basically hitting 235 240 going forward um and ending the season with nine or ten homers and 10 to 12 stolen bases so i you know you could just hold tight and an ale only what are you going to do you're going to hold tight he's still playing but when it starts getting to 15 teamers where i have him on the bench i've been i've been i've been nursing him on the bench and i i think this is the week i'm going to drop him mm. i i i don't want to play him anymore and he's in that age range you know 32 33 is when those those projections become you know a little bit less meaningful the strikeout rate is bad the swing strike rate is bad his chase rate is not bad for the league, but it's his second worst of his career. Uh, his barrel rate is down back almost to where he was when he had no power. Um, and so I just, uh, how much do I want eight more steals? Like, I don't even know if I believe 10 more steals the rest of the season, right? We're almost through a third of the season. He has two, two steals. Has he even attempted more? No, he's attempted two steals. That's fairly sticky. So I think he might end the season with five homers and six stolen bases. I think the question Even I would if he have gets the ten Grossman. homers and six stolen bases. Do I want the two thirty average and ten homers and six stolen bases? Like, I think the number of leagues you want that in is getting very small. I think the question with Grossman is just still like, how much is the gap between his ability as a real player and as a fantasy player? You know, the the OBP versus average thing changes a lot if you were trying to find a a struggling outfielder to buy low on to trade for in a deep league. I could sort of see it if you're in an OBP situation in an average situation. I think that's just been a clear flaw of his for a while. Then the other he's also would be, not a good defensive outfielder. So, right. And I think that limits his trade appeal too. So the idea of him going to a better team, which I thought was going to happen a year ago, I thought Robbie Grossman <laughs> right. was a shoe in to get traded to a contender and be the, I mean, he's the clear third outfielder or the, the he could the be a fourth, fourth outfielder. outfielder. Yeah. I mean, he's, so, a, he's a switch hitter though. So it's not, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, there were some, uh, there was, you know, so the Jed Lowry was in this offseason, right? And Darren Ruff, right? The Giants re-signed Darren Ruff, who has less defensive value than Jed Lowry, right? But he's a yeah. right-handed hitter who damages, who can do damage against left-handed hitters. So he has a very useful use, right? And like, oh, this is when we would use him. Against lefties. I mean, he's being used a little bit more than that, but that's, that's, I think he was predictable in how you would use him and good at this one thing. Now, Grossman is more of a meh at a lot of things, right? So that's a little bit weird to have as a fourth outfielder. I guess, I mean, you do want to put him in center. So he's not a defensive backup and he's a switch hitter. So how much can you believe his, his splits and be like, oh, we'll use him against lefties or we'll use him against righties? So in a way, he he's like a little bit like Jed Lowry, isn't he? I mean, he's actually a lot like Jed Lowry. Yeah, I think with less power, s- even similar limitations. I'm I'm surprised though, just because I thought he was a high floor player. I mean, he's yeah. 32, so yeah, age might be part of the factor here, and he'll be 33 before the season ends. He'll turn 33 in September, but um, I I didn't get him not because I thought he was bad, but just because I. I saw a little more of what you saw, low average, 15-15 kind of being the high side and then maybe less power being part of, of what he would bring. So curious to see if any team is interested and, and takes a takes a shot. But I think it has to be the right fit. It has to be a team that actually has a good backup center fielder. Maybe they've got a utility guy that can play center field and Grossman can be the two corners plus DH if they don't have a couple DH clogs already in place. We talked a lot about Trent Grisham, so we're not going to bring him up again. But Nelson Cruz sort of came up in passing on the 3 0 show. And looking at his line, 227, 298, 325 so far. Actually, pretty good roto numbers despite the line. Four homers, 19 runs, 23 RBIs, and a steal. You'd actually be okay with that to this point. But I think it would lead you to questions about what comes next. Like, is this finally the end for Nelson Cruz? Do you know, you were just saying, like, uh, have you, uh, you know, it is something within the realm of, of, of normalcy, 
for the for a player, right? We were just talking about rolling grass and using that. So I was pulling out. I was like, wow, that's a pretty big ground ball rate for Nelson Cruz. Uh, he was nowhere near this in 2021. Never, never near this. He's had two, you know, sort of 10, five, 10 game stretches of being rolling at 60% ground balls this year. Last year, the, the, he, he never was over 50. Now I'm going to, I'm going to move the nice thing about this uh, rolling graph is I can, I can push it out further. So I'm going to push it out to 2018. And I bet you it's still going to be the highest ground ball rate he's shown. Okay. Back in 2018, he had a moment. I was like that. Was it a bad year? 2018 for Nelson Cruz? Not really. I think so. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there was a 37 home run season. It was his last season in Seattle. 256, I will say, though, 509, 37 homers. I will say that 2018, the ball was different. His barrel rate was different. His max EV was different. So, you know, if you put him 2018 in this year uh and then gave him this year's barrel you know what i mean like i i still think it's a bad sign that the barrel rate is down the max ev is down the ground ball rate is up it's it it doesn't look good to me across the board and then you've got the age 41 would you have dropped him already or would you drop him now in some of those shallow leagues that we're talking about there's also like a risk reward proposition, right? It's like with with Grossman, the reward, the potential reward is lower, I would say. You know? Comparatively, yes. So I would probably be nursing uh, him on the bench a- as I have been in these 15 team leagues with Grossman. I'd probably be nursing him on the bench a little bit longer. Um, but as I'm finally getting to the point where I've been in, begun dropping Grossman, where you know, I have two or three shares of him. If I had more shares of Cruz, um, I, I'd be about a week or two away. I mean, I don't know what I'm waiting for. From a, a, a from broader, rolling graph perspective, too, the ground ball rate is still up. From a broader trade perspective and thinking about the humidor and the ball and things that we're always wondering about, thinking about Nationals Park and D.C. and one of the more hot, humid, hitter-friendly environments in the league, especially as the weather warms up, I wonder if we're going to see a big fluctuation mm. there. Kind of the opposite of what we've seen in Oakland, right? The the damp basement playing even more soggy than usual in Oakland early in the season. Maybe we get Nationals Park to be among the parks that is even more lively than usual because of the humidor and, and ball interaction that we're going to see. And we're going to see massive summers from the four or five hitters in this lineup that have been... Well, Josh Bell's been good, but even Juan Soto hasn't quite been himself. Cruz is obviously underperformed. I wonder if we're going to get a turnaround from a few of these bats just because of the ball being different as this weather pattern kind of changes. Yeah. I wonder if there's, I mean, I think, uh, I think I'd feel like pretty confident buying K- Kybert Ruiz, you know, puts a ton of balls in play, he puts so many balls in play. And if he did get, you know, another 80 points of ISO and he could maybe finish the season with like, you know, seven or eight more homers, even that seems, you know, kind of, impossible to say about a guy who's one homer i think you know that you could do that you just rattle off a, a month with three or four you know um and uh, i could i would totally buy bell um and i think it's possible to buy bell because the iso is down and the homer rate you know that's not great and you know people maybe some people are looking at the average maybe some people looking at the homers and saying saying no thanks so um i think yadiel hernandez is a is a decent buy high um, so yeah, I would say that about most of those guys in that, in that, in that lineup that I would do it. And Nelson Cruz, just the, it's the age, man. What do you think about Lane Thomas? Uh, yeah, we got a question about Lane Thomas recently. I don't have the email in front of me, so I can't thank the person that sent it, but I was just watching him in that series. I think the Brewers caught the nationals recently and Thomas played pretty well in that series. O swing is still pretty good at 25.8%. You know, for the season, the K rate is still up compared to where it was a season ago. He We're struggled not... with that a little bit back and forth. Yeah, I, I wonder how much of this has just been the the strange shape of of his playing time. You know, he hasn't played as much as I would have thought. It's been a little more in and out of the lineup earlier in the season. All that being said, what are they going to do instead of playing Lane Thomas? 
It's kind of mm-hmm. like your Hernandez argument where it's like, are, are these players tradable? Are they likely to get moved as the Nationals move some players at the deadline? No. So I mean, they picked him up on like a, a waiver claim, right? Or was it? It was a small, small, deal. small deal, I think, with the Cardinals. But yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of in for deeper leagues, like 15 team leagues and deeper. I don't. Th- it, it's kind of similar to the Grossman profile for me, where I'm not sure we're going to get a good batting average, but the OBP is good enough for him to end up in a decent spot in the lineup. And then you've got this combination of, of power and speed that can be intriguing when the playing time gets high enough. So I it see is more really good than weird. Bad. To see that low of a chase rate and that low of a walk rate, it it suggests to me that he's you know basically taking the wrong pitches. You know, like there's that there's some approach thing that could click for him. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, sit slider or something. <laughs> hard hit rate up over forty percent, which I think for a deeper league especially is is good enough. So limited in terms of the number of leagues where I'm interested, but um. I'm kind of patient with him in some of those spots. Could be and, like a, uh, an only league by though, yeah. Yeah, good player to trade for in NL only league, especially again helping four more people. That's why we talked about bananas. More than everyone listening eat bananas. <laughs> Fairly confident in that. Uh, how about one more positive one as we kind of look at more of these struggling hitters that I, I think at least is a good idea to go after right now. Yes, money Grandal. The overall line is Ooh. just light across the board. The plate skills are intact. And the White the Sox here, I like it. I'm the White sure Sox, man, you. they're gonna hit. They're gonna score runs. There, yeah. there's gonna be some some rebound in this offense as a whole. And Grandal, I think, is gonna be a big part of it. I'm just worried. With, there's a sort of the Grossman thing. Is the reward worth it? Because you know he is a lifetime 238 hitter. The projections are for 220. You know, yeah, maybe you can get 13, 14 more homers. It's gonna come with a 220 average. I'm I'm dealing with this right now in my 12 team keeper league. I've been trying to trade MJ Melendez and no one's taken him. Uh I've got Yasmani Grandal as my starter. It's an OPS league, so you know, there is there is that. And I do think Grandal it will give me a good OPS. But it's it's average and OPS. And some part of me says, you know, just drop Grandal in this 12 team keeper league. He's older. It's not good. The batting average is always going to be a sink on you. And keep the young guy who could be good. You know? I am not telling you to get rid of Melendez because he hits the ball very hard and can carve out a larger role. But I think with Grandal, he's still controlling the zone really well. Yes. K rate is actually at a career best at 19.9%. Not surprisingly, chase rate is still good. Barrel rate's not horrible at 7.8 percent it's low for him but it's low within his Ground range all rate up is up and barrel rate is down you know i don't know and I the max ev is down too i think it's just an adjustment i think it's an adjustment before he gets back to being the grand doll i mean look in the second half of last year with a bad knee no less he was that's true rushing the ball what if he's just hiding an injury i mean that's that's another thing i worry about with catchers yeah i guess the other thing though you mentioned the average we talked about gary sanchez on our last episode the yeah. threshold for average right now, it's as low as it's ever been. I'm not mm. worried about that 220, 230 risk. Yes, let's let's have a, a breathless league batting average update. 237. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mentioned Juan Soto <laughs> struggling it, just because I and, and again, it's, it's all relative. WRC plus wise is 33% better than league average. Juan Soto is hitting 236 this season. The baseball league average is completely. <laughs> Eft. This is a career 295 hitter hitting 236 while walking more than he strikes out. He's still Juan Soto in so many ways, and yet he's hitting 236 because the baseball is an orange in a sock that has gone through the <laughs> washing machine. Uh, the ISO is up to 149 over the league. ISO is up to 149 over the last 30 days. Um, it was for the full season. It was 144, so it's it's creeping forward. All right, Jeez. so let's move on from uh, some maybe you convince me. I don't know. I'm I'm very convincing, at least with fruit related <laughs> things. All right. Let's move on from struggling bats. Let's talk about Jeffrey Springs for a moment. There was a request in the YouTube comments to discuss him. And I think it's it's really easy when a, a new Ray emerges and it's someone that you kind of expected to be working more 
out of the pen. You just have this sort of reflexive, eh, okay, I don't really need to worry about him. The workload's not going to be that good. Results have been great so far. He's got a 132 ERA, a .80 whip, 27 Ks in 27 and a third innings. Uh, we look at the usage here, and more recently, he has been working as a starter. He's gone four, four and two-thirds, and now five and two-thirds in his last three appearances. So uh, what are we looking at with Springs? What type of, of ceiling does he bring, and in what types of leagues should we be interested? Let me sort by player name and then look by appearance. Uh, one reason I do this, I'd look at the per-appearance chart uh, because it, there is a big difference in what your stuff does in in larger uh, in larger samples or in, in, in when you have to go longer. So uh, early in the season when he was throwing uh, 16, 15 pitches per appearance, he was regularly had a stuff plus over 100. Um, now that he's throwing uh, 30 to 40, uh, you know, so his uh, 31 pitch appearance on the third, he had a 95 stuff plus his 57 pitch appearance. The next one, he had a 92 stuff plus, uh, but it was back up to 107 and 102. The last two, what is has been true all along is really good command. So I believe uh, the command, the stuff kind of, I think, goes ebbs and flows a little bit with how far he has to go into the game and how he doles his pitches out. Um, yeah, let me look at his per pitch data now. Is this like Bruce Zimmerman with one fewer pitch right now? Uh huh. Uh, let's see here. It's Jeffrey Springs, change up, uh, 109 stuff plus slider 101, forcing fastball 94. So bad fastball guy who locates them well. Bad fastball guy who locates them well and doesn't throw it excessively, he throws it like 40. He almost throws 50-50 with the changeup. That's crazy. Yeah, he used to throw the slider more. I wonder if that'll change now that he's going through these longer outings. Uh, but I'm I'm, uh, I'm intrigued not just because he's a Ray. I'm intrigued because there's two seemingly good non-fastball pitches here, and the usage has been at a level that, hey, it's good enough to get wins, and damn it, we need wins. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and he's starting those games. It's not even going to follow. But there is a little bit of the Drew Rasmussen problem where they are kind of limiting him to 15 to 20 batters faced. So it's going to be tough to to squeeze some wins out of this one, I think. It's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Can you say something else? Uh, <laughs> God, did you just pick him up? No, but in, in leagues where he's available, I'm definitely targeting him well I, I mean at al only i think really uh really go for it uh 15 team leagues i think i would like to pick him up as a two starter yeah on and off maybe with two starts or streaming opportunities because with two starters you just get two chances at that win right so maybe one game he only pitches three innings four innings the other game he gets to five and, and gets that win you know um, I do think that the risk that they leave him out there for like a seven earned run appearance is pretty low. Right. That's yeah. That's how many teams, how many teams are in that group, right? This isn't just the Rays. Like this, these are other teams that use their pitchers in a way that gives us more confidence in how they're actually going to fare because they're not going to sit need... up there and wear it. You need a, I mean, I think what you need is other bulk guys in the pen, right? Like you need a, a whole team that where, you know, you've got multiple bulk options for every game, basically, right? So some teams are just like, uh, we don't have that. <laughs> but the Rays are like, yeah, you know, we, we throw Jeffrey Springs out there, then maybe Yar Ryan Yarborough, uh, you know, who, who might have been the starter tomorrow, he can pitch tonight and we we'll change things around. Or Josh Fleming can go a couple innings, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, all right. I'm in on Springs. 27% K rate, 7% mm -hmm. walk rate. It's good enough to play in those deeper mixed leagues. I am keeping an eye on the schedule, though, as far as. I think sure I, I generally agree. Schedule. You know, anybody, you know, the average uh, stuff plus for a starter is 97. So he's keeping it around there or better. The command uh, looks really good and has for long enough to believe in it. Um, There's a three pitch pitch mix. Uh, the, the, 
the fastball isn't even isn't like there are fastballs that have 80 stuff plus and 70 stuff plus you know what i mean like this is it's not one of the worst fastballs in the league or anything so and then Martin he's perez and he one of those guys <laughs> do we want to do this it's actually it's it's good for comedy a little bit um let's uh now do sort by pitch name for scene oh. i want the guys with the worst fastballs who've pitched really well so far this season because martin perez has been amazing <laughs> and if you have him you're just scared to use him in anything but an easy matchup because you're you're sure that there's going to be oh. some crooked numbers coming. Oh, I'll, I'll do starters. How about this? Jacob yeah. Junis. Okay. Uh, 38-7. <laughs> but he's only thrown 14. So Zach Thompson has thrown 90 at a 41 stuff plus. Great. Eric Fetty thrown 40 at a 48 stuff plus. Oh, Matthew Libertor's first 16 fastballs registered at a 48 stuff plus. That's ugly. Here we go. This is this is something I have noticed, and it, I don't know how nervous to make it. Noah Syndergaard, mm. 52 stuff plus, 131 four-seamers thrown. Joe Musgrove, 52. Patrick Corbin. 53 that one not, was that probably... was not surprising no not surprising well, two before that especially musgrove i think that's pretty surprising that he'd be that bad because he's been great going back to the beginning of last season yeah uh, i mean he he throws a bunch of pitches right so i think he probably uh what it, what you can see with this is he locates the the pitch well so I think he just probably is very careful about when he uses the four seam and he locates it well and so he doesn't get screwed as much. Oh, Cindergard, 50% fastball usage. That's surprising to me. And and the numbers don't like it. And and you know, you like you can use you can use raw numbers, like the fastball velo is not back. No, you he's at I mean? 94. I mean, he's that's average now. Three and a half ticks below where he was at his peak. Four ticks below. Yeah. So uh, I I personally think Noah Syndergaard's a, a sell high. I don't, and I just happen to have him in leagues where I can't even trade. So, but yeah, if I so could you, trade, I would sell him high. So you're not worried about the the cinder guard finds extra velo and gets the K rate up scenario, really. You're just saying, eh, this is probably just a, a a lighter version of the guy he used to be, and and maybe it's a high threes, low fours ERA with a, a decent WHIP, but the K rate's going to be below average, so you're going to be disappointed. If there is any sort of second act for the humidor, you know, <laughs> um, I, I think that this is the type of pitcher that would struggle from it. Now, the, uh, Jeff Zimmerman had some research that said the first three appearances back from injury um, are basically predict the rest of your velocity for the year. Uh, his first three starts back, he was sitting 94, 94, five or something. It's only gotten worse since. Yeah, almost so, seems more likely if he's going to get some velo back, it's going to be after an off season. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and like you can see it in the strikeout rate. You know, like it's not a good strikeout rate. No, he's no, he's surviving on a fair amount of good, like okay pitches, and uh, he you know he has good command. That's something that when he was a power pitcher, he was he was so good because he. He had the power and the command, but now uh, he's more he's more in common with JT Brewbreaker than uh, you want to know. Oh, that, that's sorry about that. I, uh, feel, I feel mean toward J, uh, JT Brewbreaker right now. No, I, that uh, reaction. Bre Brewbreaker's actually throwing harder these days. Uh, there's JT Brewbreaker's uh, fastball, four seam fastball, 65 stuff plus. Uh, Sandwich in between Jose Quintana's 65 and Herman Marquez's 65. Although uh, Colorado ones should come with a little bit of uh, an asterisk, I guess. Dakota Hudson's here. Michael Pineda's here. Am I surprising you? Like, the only one was Musgrove that really surprised me. Yeah. Rod Rodriguez is here. Ranger Suarez is here. Uh, David Peterson is here. Uh, Patrick Sandoval. But we already knew that he didn't have a good fastball, right? Like we knew... We knew that his his whole thing was surprising change up, four good pitches, uh, I mean two good secondaries, and you know, you know, 
to keep away with the fastball. Yeah, I mean, having a slider and a change that he throws as often as he does and a curveball, like, I'm pretty content to bet on that mix. It almost it it. makes me wonder, too, if the Angels can look at Syndergaard and and say, let's just dial down the fastball usage some more because he's got plenty of pitches, too. Yeah. Syndergaard can throw other stuff, and maybe that's his path to getting the strikeout rate up and maintaining something close to his current effect. His overall stuff stuff plus would go up, too, right? Because he'd just be using less of this of this bad pitch. Yeah, it's not hopeless, but you're just kind of pushing for an adjustment, and you're not sure if it's going to be made or not. Right, right. You're 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 in the pitching coach's hands. Also, like you know, he didn't throw any breaking balls at all when he came back in that for that one start last year. Um, and so, is he like you know sort of tender on the breaking balls? Yeah, he's definitely used to throw more breaking balls. Than he does now right now and uh, as well. So, wondering, you know. Maybe he starts to feel better and starts to feel better with the elbow and can push the slider usage, you know, to 25% and the and the curveball to 10 to 12%. That would be in line with what he's done in the past, a little bit more aggressive. But he has to be more aggressive because the fastball is not as good as it used to be. I hope he makes the adjustments because it's more fun when he's pitching. Well, he well. won't. He won't with a three ERA. So there might no, have to yeah. be some bad stuff that comes first, and then the secondary start going up. Yeah, you're gonna have to absorb uh, a few bad. Look at outings. the bat, though. By the way, zips three nine seven rest of season. Bat says four five six. There's a lot, and it's not the number you'd expect to see in that space, but it starts to make sense the more that you actually break it down. We need to go. Uh, before we go, a quick schedule update with the Memorial Day holiday coming up on Monday. No show at the beginning of the week. We will have a show uh, next Thursday. So only one episode coming out next week. We will have a three O show as well. So two oh, episodes. Oh, grill some brats or some veggie brats if that's what you're into. Go have some beer or some non-alcoholic beer if that's what you're into. Maybe even maybe even like a a, a spritzer. Uh... I. You know, it's like just been a like lime and ginger or, you know, it's been a really hard week. Yes. Couple of weeks, or <laughs> just for obviously the, a ton of terrible things happening in the world yeah. right now. So take the time away and do whatever you can do. Unplug Hug your children, go to a beach. Oh, just can. don't do body scroll. of water. Don't doom scroll. Oh my God, I felt doom myself doom scrolling so excessively awful. and it's, oh, it God. hurts and it sucks. And, it's 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 just one of those things. Anything, Not helpful. You know, I got a you can do. I got a list of things like how to talk to your children about what's what's happening. And one of the things that it said on there was, "Don't watch the news." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, you're right." It's, kind of, it's kind of true. I mean, that that's just unplugging, right? So, yeah, advice to parents as well. But just oh reset God. for your own uh, well-being and sanity. Because I know it, it's, look, it's hard. No matter what you do, it's hard to get up every day in the face of bad news and just do whatever it is you do. And whether and, that's dropping your kids off at school, whether you're a teacher, whether you make baseball podcasts, it weighs on you throughout the day. So just do whatever you have to do to feel better. And, and my heart goes out to everybody, everybody in Texas, because, uh, but especially parents of elementary school, like I, my kids are in elementary school and I was just like, uh, I, 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 I can't, you know, but the thing is there's work to be done and the work can only be done if you're in, an, in the headspace to do it, you know, like it can, mm-hmm. you can't really get hopeful work done in despair. And so you know, I know in this household, uh, we're working uh, on some things and um, ho- hoping to help some campaigns, um, you know, who will hopefully do something about this because I think something needs to be done. And I don't think uh, pointing to past fail policies and saying, oh, these things didn't work and just throwing up your hands is the answer, man. <laughs> like, no, it's, there it's more not. people die of gun violence in this country than any other country and just throwing up the hands and being like what could we do that's <laughs> uh, not enough for me anymore so no, no a lot of the alternative solutions if you want to call them that are just pure galaxy brain stuff too oh, we my goodness. need to do the simple things that would help make everyone safer it's just Go look at a graph of gun violence by, you know, states that have more, uh, more things in place, more restrictions in place. And look at the global restrictions are possible. Yeah. Look at the global, at the global numbers global too. Yeah. It's not, it's not a population thing. It's a volume of guns thing. It's not hard 
to understand yeah. that. But do what you need to do to feel better over these next few days. Take the time to recharge if you can. We are going to do that, and we are going to be back with you next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>